Okay, welcome to this week's charting analysis webinar. My name is Jasper Lawler. We've got the risk warning on the screen. We'll just shoot through that and then get into discussing some of the kind of key price levels and events this week. Any questions at all, feel free to use the Q&A or chat box, and I'm happy to uh, offer my opinion. So, the uh, the huge theme that was just dominating every asset, every asset class last week was the, the strength of the U.S. dollar. Um, so, without further ado, let's let's just shoot it straight away and have a look at um, how significant this dollar moving the dollar has been, and, and how significant it can be uh, price-wise. So, here's dollar yen. Now, this was the peak that we formed back in December at 122. Um, the cause for this um, this previous rally, um, culmination of things, uh, to some extent the quantitative easing introduced in Japan, and also to a large extent the sort of reverse policy from the Federal Reserve in the U.S. Um, ending their t ending, uh, their quantitative easing program, and now what we've uh, got to is the the possibility of a of a rate hike being imminent sometime this year. So back down to this daily chart here, but you can see the scope of where we're at here. We've had this huge rally. Now, understandable pullback. It didn't happen at 120, but it did happen at 122, just above. You know, we pulled all the way back down to 115-ish, and we've been in this sideways range. But leading into this Wednesday's meeting of the FOMC, the Federal Reserve, we're right back up at this 122 level. Now, as of right now, we're, we're still in a trading range, and uh, you know, you know, based on this candlestick, there's still probably the high probability uh, trade at this point is is selling back into the range rather than the breakout. But whether this range holds or whether the breakout maintains um, is largely going to be as a result of what happens on Wednesday. And you can see this very tight trading action. It could go either way. Um, this is just a reverse of this big round number, um, and then but since then it's essentially been inside days all the way, and so when you get a kind of build up of tight trading action like this, it generally precedes quite a strong volatile breakout. So should be good for trading. The thing is calling which way the breakout's going to go is is the tricky bit. Now there are various strategies you can employ to try and um, try and take advantage. Now, obviously, number one is just kind of calling the top of the range. You know, a breakout much beyond here, and, uh, and you know you're wrong. Um, you know, going short back into the range ahead of Wednesday, trying to get the best price possible in this in this consolidation. Equally, you can see that these these peaks here, this kind of general trading zone, has been support a couple of times. Now, you could be expecting the breakout. Um, which you know would not be unreasonable because we've had such a, such a strong dollar, um, and that's an in, in, in anticipation that the uh, Fed are going to remove their forward guidance uh, forward guidance language, um, guiding us as to how long they're going to keep rates close to zero. You know they've they've said that they're um, going to be patient, uh, but there is. Um, the reason for this strong rally in the dollar that we saw last week, um, and you know that that's the reason for the strong dollar, um, is uh, because there's an expectation that it's going to lead towards higher interest rates, and that was what caused a, a drop off in in U.S. stocks. Um, so the U.S. 30 and the U.S. SPX 500, um, U.S. NDAC 100 all fell last week um, for the same reason that the dollar rallied. Um, and there's a anticipation that the Fed is basically going to take out this language, and then within the next, uh, two meetings later, they could hike interest rates. That's what, they, that's what they've said. The removal of the forward guidance means in two meetings' time they could hike rates, depending on economic data. So that's pretty huge, because we've had 20 plus central banks this year cut interest rates, um, and the Fed are looking to hike interest rates. So, you know, that's why the dollar is so strong, because it's just not only is it hiking interest rates, everyone else is cutting. So you could 
looking for opportunities to buy around this kind of support area. I don't see it going too much lower than that. Of course, I could be wrong, but um, going into the meeting, I think we're going to stay pretty tight. So any dips down into there are sort of value areas to buy off for the breakout. Or you could take the approach of actually buying on or selling a move out of this range. Um, you could have a sort of, um, a, you know, you, you make use of buy stop orders, sell stop orders beneath or enter the market. Um, obviously, you're getting a worse price and it will be volatile at that point. So just keep in mind, you know, especially when you're using market orders or stop orders, stop orders get filled at the next available market price. So you could end up entering the market up here somewhere when you wanted to enter down here. That's, that, you know, that's, not, uh, that's just the nature of a sort of breakout type trade in, in high volatile markets. Um, <clears throat> so there's some of the options there. And then if we, um, if we just flip out of, out of currencies for a second, um, we're looking at sort of the oldest currency out there, gold. You can see it's basically the opposite. Not quite, but we are pushing into this multi-year low. Looking on a um, weekly basis, you know, obviously dollar yen has been surging up in a straight line, but gold has been gradually trending down. And this weakness in this last, last leg since we hit 1300 has been largely dollar strength um, in anticipation that the Fed and its monetary policy is really diverging from the rest of the world. And so, yeah, we're in a similar position here where either, you know, 1150 to 1130 is going to hold and we're going to get a sort of, a, a sort of temporary at least sort of bot, double bottom type situation where we've made a low, not been able to make a new low and then it holds up, or it's a breakout and gold is renewing its downtrend and, um, you know, then we could see substantially lower prices in gold. So, you know, and the, the reason that the, the fact that both of these are at these multi-year levels is not uncoincidental. It is leading into this Wednesday meeting and that's really, the, you know, that's, that's what's going to determine the strength of the dollar. Now, in terms of specific um, other economic announcements on the, uh, you know, relating to the U.S. dollar, today we have industrial production. I think that could push push markets up a bit because we have some generally, actually slightly weaker U.S. data. Last week it was notable the dollar strength in the face of fairly weak economic data, notably retail sales slipping for another month, um, just showing that the consumer is not really biting into this uh, lower oil price story at the moment. Um, a lot of the jobs that have been created are more like low-wage jobs in the U.S., and so people don't actually have, even though they're in work, which is certainly better than not being in work, they don't have the spending power to go out and push up the amount of retail sales out there. So that's, that's a worry for the U.S. economy. And so industrial production will be another factor to play into the general state of the U.S. economy. You know, it's looking a bit like at the moment that the U.S. is producing a lot of jobs, but the economy still looks a bit precarious in other areas. So that will be a consideration for the Fed, and that certainly will have a bearing on how they how they phrase things and how they change their statement and whether they, in fact, do remove this uh, this language. You know, you you feel you fall on one side of the fence here. It's either that they are cautious because of all the other data, or, or they're you know they're hawkish. Uh, in ready to hike rates because of the labor market data. Uh, but otherwise, you know, not too much going on um, in terms of the, uh, the U.S. apart from that big one um, on Wednesday and, and industrial production today. If we're looking at the British pound, this is actually a pretty big, busy week for the, for the, um, for the U.K. Pretty much all takes place on, on Wednesday where we have Average earnings data, um, the uh, the vote count from the uh, Monetary Policy Committee, and um, and the uh, the budget. Now, in terms of the budget, that I would argue perhaps is um, is probably going to be fairly business friendly. I would think there is some talk of um, it perhaps including a cut to business rates. Um, so I think overall for the sort of the state of the UK economy is probably going to come across quite well. 
that which would be positive for the pound. But I think actually the bigger driver of the pound is, aside from the other side of the coin, which is the U.S. dollar, I think it is going to be this average earnings data and uh, the voting from the, from the MPC. Um, consensus is that it's going to remain 9-0. Is in nine people, uh, nine members voting to keep rates on hold, and I think that's probably going to stay as is because inflation data has not really been overwhelming, although wages have picked up uh, according to the last um, set of data. So the, what we're looking for is a, what, what, the key bit of data for the pound will be the average earnings data because we saw a pick up last month. So if we see that again. Now, that's a real strong sign that the U.K. does not suffer from the same issues that the U.S. does, where it's creating jobs, but they're low paid and not, um, you know, wages aren't going up alongside their numbers of extra jobs. You know, so if wages are picking up, retail sales should pick up, and the consumption led economy, that should be good. Um, and we have seen retail sales perform a lot better in the U.K. vis-a-vis the U.S. Um, but... It is this dollar-related story again, and the you know the pound is at multi-year lows. It's not um, faring as badly as the euro, but it is definitely getting punished, um, and it's below 150, which is key. Um, you know, we obviously we dipped below 150 um, for the first time in January, but it held up pretty well, and um, didn't I don't think we might, might have been open below it or on it. And then we rallied all the way up to 155, but, you know, take note, there's that round number. You know, when you look back, trading can be so simple. Buy at 150, sell at 155, you know. This time it was a break. You wouldn't want to have bought that time, but still, even if you had, you'd be up twice. Um, so you to pay attention to these big round numbers. They do matter. <clears throat> and the fact that we've broken through it this time is significant. So... Um, this is a fairly distinct downtrend in the short term, but you've got to pay attention to the fact that, yeah, boom, got that nice little rally, but back in this consolidation area that um, where we broke down from that low on the weekly chart, touched that, which was also 155, boom, now we're below these multi-year lows. So this line that you can see here on the weekly chart, um, you could also draw it there slightly above based on that low. Um, but you can see, you know, I'm sure you've all looked at this chart. It, doesn't, it goes all the way back to 2010. So we're, we're at low, the lowest we've been in since 2010 on the pound. <clears throat> now, arguably, that's the time to buy if you've got deep pockets. It may turn around before we get down to this low at 142. But, you know, I'd advise just um, you know, waiting for a more solid sign of a, a rebound. That's certainly what, um, you know, at the moment... We're not seeing that, you know, with prices are just dive bombing at the moment. <clears throat> so we could get a slight lift off, um, and then if we did get back up to this 149.50 type area, to me, you know, that would be a logical. You know, it's typically what you see, right? Is um, you know, move down. Uh, there's the high, low. You know, um, there's the high up, down, test that high up, test that high. You know, that's what we're looking for on a larger scale. So look down, test test that low, move the low, move lower again. You know that general idea of um, support turns to resistance after the break. Resistance turns to support after the break if we test it. Um, so it could push up to this next level. This one to me is not so significant now, um, although that is the kind of last peak that we've seen. It could jump up to there, but again, dependent on the um, the FOMC and the Bank of England and, and wage data, that's going to determine whether we can actually pull back more significantly within this downtrend, but this is slightly different to say the dollar yen scenario where we have broken down now. Um, we closed a week below and a few days below, so it's um, definitely a downturn for the pound at the moment. Now, if we do look at the euro, you know, it's been in the, in the press a lot more than it, it normally is. This is just a, a long-term chart to keep in mind. This is a monthly chart. Not something you need to look at on a particularly regular basis, but at the moment, do you notice we've been in a fairly consistent channel, and we're at the bottom of that channel now. So, um, again, without much confirmation that this is a low, it's um, it's, a, it's a risky proposition to be buying euros right now. But um, 
nonetheless, that, that pattern's there. So if we do start seeing some turnaround on the short term, you know, keep in mind the context of why that might be taking place. Should we push lower? I think this, this peak from back in, um, back in 2002 could be of some interest. This whole consolidation area here going as low as 96. Of course, we've got, um, you know, of course, we've got parity just beneath that as well. In the middle of that range, there's the parity, which is a lot of people are calling for now in euro to the dollar. Um, so, yeah, here's the here's the, uh, the daily chart, you know, and obviously looking a lot. Here's the, here's the equivalent low that we saw in the, that we were discussing in the pound, but we've been trading way below it for several for several you know a couple of weeks even. And um, so pretty pretty shallow pullbacks, if any, in the euro of late. Um, but keep in mind this long-term potential support. But nonetheless, you know, should the Fed remove the um, the, the afford guidance um, in the context of the, the quantitative easing, which is heading into its second week now, from the European Central Bank, you know, definitely the path of least resistance is, is lower. Okay, let's um, let's just switch gears now to the um, um, Alexander. Yeah, just kind of question here about why would that peak back then be significant? I, I would imagine you're talking about um, that euro chart I just had up, right? Um, um, just well, number one thing to keep in mind is that. Um, the technical indicators and the support and resistance that you see on the longer time frame charts um, are always more significant than the ones that you see on the shorter term. So this is a monthly chart. So you know this was a peak that the markets ran into and stayed. But you know we got a strong rally up and then stayed below there for one, one, two, three, four, five. And then broke through in the six months. So something, that, you know, a price level that can hold prices down for near on half a year, even though it was a long time ago, um, is, is you know, that's, that's significant. Equally, um, you can see that this this low, not worked at all, completely blasted through that. But you can see, so we had that peak there. That was a multi-year low. We broke through it. We came back. We tested. And then even what's a off the cuff I mean you could even say something along the lines of this peak here you know you tend to get at least some kind of reaction from these peaks. I'm not finding the ultimate examples here. Um, this has obviously been a massive plunge. In the euro, but the, the, the general concept being that you know these old levels come back into play, um, and just you know it's the nature of trading support and resistance is that um, there's uh, you know there's peaks and there's troughs, so you're kind of choosing one of the two to, to trade off, and uh, when it's on a monthly chart, it just takes on that much longer significance. Based on the examples I give here, is you know these lows, these lows, these lows probably wouldn't hold up too much uh, hope. But I guess when you're looking for a confluence of indicators, um, you know the fact that it hovers around that parity level as well adds a little bit of extra weight to it. Um, yeah, switching over to, to equities, since we're in the, uh, you know, I'm calling from the UK, we'll just start with the UK, and since it is quite a big month for the UK, um, I would say the effects of the budget probably are going to be a bit more concentrated within the stock market than, um, than currencies, given the other data that's taken place for the pound. Um, now, here's the situation. With the, this is the weekly chart that we've looked at many, many times. Here's that 6,900 level that we broke through and substantially fell below a couple of weeks later. So, you know, we're in, a, we're in an uptrend here uh, over the sort of longer haul, just about. 
but you know we didn't you know we didn't make much of a new high but we did and so what we're sort of theoretically looking for given that that was a higher high we're looking for a higher low to end somewhere before this low is the way I think about it that to me was the last significant low if we're in an uptrend the next low formed needs to be before that at the very worst case scenario at that obviously in terms of buying um, that's the best place to be buying because it's a, the, the lowest risk theoretically because if it does drop below there we're not really in an uptrend anymore so you probably don't necessarily want to be buying there so then you can get out fairly quickly the higher you're buying you know the more theoretical risk because it could still drop to here and, and pull higher again technically it would still sort of fall within the characteristics of an uptrend even if it sort of met its previous low as long as it didn't drop below it still okay but um, I've got this box on the chart here just kind of symbolizing you know we had these couple of strong reversals so that's the bottom and then just where it actually did accelerate and close higher started in this kind of vicinity about the sort of six, just under 6600 so that to me is a, is a big one but if we drop down to the daily chart we can see that uh, here this was a low here that we were kind of looking to hold we didn't which to me is a, is a symbol of weakness um, we did shoot back above it again fairly quickly so it didn't get any immediate follow through but we had just fallen quite significantly to get to that so to me my bias is even though sort of longer term um, well medium term I think we're probably looking at higher prices in the FTSE because UK stocks are going to be supported by QE from the ECB uh, albeit indirectly not as much so as for example the, the, the Germany 30 indirectly I think we will and uh, the, the, the UK 100 will but we could slide further before we get to that medium term trend taking over again <clears throat> based on the fact that we dropped below that uh, low there. Now it could happen as quickly as just this previous peak, um, but it could again happen just above the 6600 six, level would be the next one to be looking at. Below there, I think we could be slipping right back down to the low. Um, if, you know, for those, um, for those trading any individual shares today, um, based on, on the news on Sunday that the, um, the Chancellor may be, um, where he's essentially indicated he will be, um, lifting the restriction on annuities for all pensioners. Um, so any pensioner with an annuity right now can cash it out. Will be uh, after this budget, will be able to cash it out and um, invest it however they please. <coughs> Um, so that's not been too good for the insurance companies that uh, make up a large part of the annuities market, uh, but it has been better news for asset managers. Um, <clears throat> there's only a few publicly listed ones. Um, uh, Aberdeen Asset Management, um, for example, they've been doing better because some of, those, some of that money could flow to them. Uh, that's what we've seen moving around so, so far, but who knows what else is going to be in there um, in that it's probably going to affect individual stocks and individual sectors um, more than the, uh, the wider market. Um, I had, we had touched on dollar yen already. Worth mentioning that there is the uh, Bank of Japan press conference uh, rate setting meeting which is on the early hours of tomorrow. Tomorrow also consider, uh, worth considering for the euro, although I don't think it's going to push the market around too much. <clears throat> Maybe a cause for a slight further pullback in the euro as we've got the um, German ZEW data. And on Thursday, for those who dare trade the Swiss franc, we do have the uh, Swiss National Bank rate setting meeting. So it may be a bit of extra information from um, from Jordan, the head of the S&P, um, SMB, um, on um, you know where where their policy goes forward following the removal of the peg against the euro. Um, let's jump over to commodities. Now it won't take long to. We've already looked at gold, but just to um, reiterate again 
we're pretty much giving going sideways and we're at that multi-year low. Very sideways, very minimal action, and I don't expect that probably to change. So on the short term, and you know, looking at opportunities of buying and selling the top of this tiny range, you, know, you can see it better on, say, like a one-hour chart. Um, arguably more of a sort of triangle perhaps taking place there that does seem to have broken out and dropped again. Generally a range, I would say. So for those inclined to do so, opportunities in these tight ranges. Similar things happening in silver. Um, so, yep, I mean, so we're also again pushing into these multi-year lows. We've got quite a decent reaction. Not the not the strongest uh, hammer pattern ever. Quite a still a large bearish body, um, but nonetheless quite a pushback. But given the weak reaction following that, um, not all that surprising. Not the strongest pattern. I think we could slip down perhaps to 15. And then this was the big reversal that catalyzed this move push up above 18. So, you know, that would be the next level obviously beneath to, to keep in mind. But I think if we dip below 15, I tend to think this is probably going to get taken out eventually. Um, Copper is just one I've been looking at a bit recently. Um, just because we've been holding on to this trend line, almost dipped below it, shot back up, and now we in copper um, are in this kind of sideways range. Worryingly, uh, Chinese markets, uh, Chinese shares pushed to five and a half year highs today um, on the on the, the hopes, um, the, the hints that there might be further government central bank stimulus in China. Um, but copper which um, has a lot of its demand from China, didn't really follow through on that. You can see we're actually lower in copper, so that's a bit of a worry. And the fact that we've broken this rising RSI trend line, sometimes you get some nice trend lines in RSI, which can precede the, the breakout in price. So if this is anything to go by, you know, we're going to head lower in prices. As for now, we're in this 262 to 271 time range. Um, and last but not least, um, we're looking at WTI. It's um, the, the spread in Brent WTI is spread out to about $10 because we've seen particular weakness in, in WTI versus Brent because of all the, um, you know, all the data to watch in the oil markets. It's always the inventories, but it's taken on particular significance given the declines in oil prices that we've seen. And every week, it's just been a huge build. And they're actually literally getting to the stage where they're running out of storage capacity for all this oil that they're not using <coughs> in the US. Um, so that, alongside the fact that it's denominated in US dollars and the dollar strengthening, um, is why we're seeing oil prices uh, push right down into these sub-$44 lows. And uh, But again, um, you know, we're, it's, it's again partly, although We've got this stockpile situation in the U.S. Um, you know, it's largely um, known. Um, it's it's quite well priced into the market. Um, uh, for me, there could be the the aspect that um, China have been buying a lot of oil at these lower prices for their strategic reserves. Um, if they stop doing that, then this support could give way. Um, but again, it's a dollar, it's a dollar situation. Um, so I think whether this low breaks could largely, again, be as a result of what happens on Wednesday. So I think that pretty neatly takes us into the end of the session here. Um, any? Uh, I'm not seeing any other questions here. So good, good luck with the trading this week. Um, I hope that was helpful. And. Um, Please, uh, please tune in again at uh, the same time next week. Uh, but for this week, you know, all eyes on the FOMC. And if you're trading the pound with the FTSE, also the, the budget and the um, average earnings data and the Bank of England. Thanks all. So that's Ballora signing out.